Okay, so we're in Ephesians 4, and uh, let's read the first few verses, and then we'll... So it says, Ephesians 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So we're going to spend most of our, well, all of our time today looking at the one spirit and the, the one hope of our calling. But what we're looking at is those seven foundations or seven pillars that make up the unity of the spirit. Um, and last time we looked at the one body, that the one body today obviously is the church, the body of Christ. Um, if you're saved today, Jew or Gentile, you are a member of the, of the body of Christ, of the church, the body of Christ, the one body. One body of believers, fellow citizens with all other saints, fellow heirs, joint heirs with Christ. That's what God's doing today. If you want to know what God's doing today, he's building the one new man, the church, the body of Christ. He's not dealing with Israel today. Um, in Israel's program, Lord Jesus Christ is presented as Israel's king. In our program, he's, he is presented as the head of the church, the body head of the body and then we also went back then to uh, we saw last time that all blessings are to be found in Christ and we're going to look at that some more a little bit today but both in the prophecy program and in the mystery program everything is vested in the Lord Jesus Christ we went back to the Old Testament and saw that Israel's salvation is in the Lord and we went in the gospel account saw that that little flock is said to be in God the Father and the Son all things are possible because of the completed work of Christ on the cross all blessings are to be found in Christ, both Israel's and the body of Christ. Members of the body of Christ, the, the one body, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So what I want to do, we're going to be here longer than I anticipated we would. Um, but I want to, we, last time we looked at the one body, this time I want to look at the one spirit and then the one hope of our calling. The one spirit, I think we all know about the spirit, but I thought what we could do, because it's brought up here, is just go look at some of the things that the spirit does and see that the spirit is is attributed to be a, a person, just like the father and just like the son are. And then we'll see that the uh, spirit also dealt with Israel differently than he deals with us today. But it's the very same spirit. Like Paul says there, there's one spirit. And... Um, we'll start to see as we go through that, that these things are dependent on one another. We're going to see some things about the spirit well, that they'll bring up things about the body. And we'll see things about the hope of our calling, which is going to bring up the spirit and the body. And we'll start to see how all this relates to each other. And the thing we want to get come to is we want to get to the point where we can understand what makes up the unity of the spirit and have, a, have an understanding of it so that when we're going through our lives and when we're dealing with people, we are, in fact, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, but we're doing it properly. We're not doing it with our own wisdom, if you will, but we're doing it from a, a scriptural viewpoint. So the one Spirit, of course, no surprise, that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and if anybody had any questions about that, I hope that ends them. <laughs> um, but look over at 1 Corinthians 12. That's all I'm going to say on that, but we'll see as we go through here. 1 Corinthians 12. And again, my same caveat, we're going to look at some of the spiritual gifts, but we're going to understand, we're going to deal with that in a little bit. But I just want you to see in this passage what the Spirit does and how it all works out. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one, and hath many members, 
and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. So again, the Spirit was, was giving, manifesting these gifts to people for the edification of the Bible in the time of Paul, at the time of Paul, again, I, like I say, I kind of like to say, this is a time-sensitive passage, if you will. Yes. And, and he's not doing that anymore because we have the completed Word of God. But if, if you look in the passage, it, the passage makes a point that the Spirit gave this person this, and this person this, and this person this, but it's all the same Spirit. There's not one Spirit of tongues, one Spirit of healing, one Spirit of prophesying, one Spirit of ministry. It is one Spirit. Spirit's got a big job. If anything, I hope we come away after looking at this and say, man, the Spirit does a lot of stuff. The Spirit is, uh, his Spirit's a busy guy. If, again, I don't, mean, I don't mean to be irreverent, but there's a, he's doing a lot, and he, he can, he's always doing a lot. Um, so he's, we, call, we, we say, you know, he's the third person of the Godhead, if you will, but not third in, in uh, um, relevance or value or rank. It's just that's how we describe it. But we're going to see, this, and the Spirit's always been. So, what, it's always the same Spirit. We, you saw it was just one Spirit that baptized all into the body of Christ. There's not a Spirit that baptized the Jew and another Spirit that baptized the Gentile into the body of Christ. It's not like the Old Testament Spirit is baptizing the Jews and the New Testament Spirit is b baptizing the Gentiles. It's one Spirit baptizing both. So, Come with me all the way back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1 and verse 2. We'll start in verse 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The same Spirit that baptizes us into the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the same Spirit that does a work in our inner man, is the same Spirit all the way back at the beginning of creation was moving over the face of the waters. We've looked at this before, you know. As I look at the Scriptures, I think that Spirit is, is laying those foundations that, that, are, that are in the earth and, and starting to give some form to it. But I, I don't really want to get into that so much as this, there's a teaching. There is a teaching out there that in the Old Testament God was the Father, in the Gospels, in the Gospels God was Jesus, and in and this is how God manifested Himself. And in the New Te and then after the cross, God manifested Himself as the Holy Spirit. Well, no, God has always existed in in the three persons. All right. There you go right there. You, you, you can actually see all three members of the Godhead there. In the beginning, God created. Well, God the Father gave the order, if you will. Jesus did the building, did the creating, and the Holy Spirit was there at the same time. Okay? So that spirit that Paul is talking, though, the exact same spirit that is working with us is the same one that was moving back there at the beginning of creation. There is only one spirit. Look over to Acts 5. Here's, I just want to go and look at some of these things, put some things in our head that I'm sure a lot of us know, but maybe give us some scriptures that will let us know why we know what we know, if you will, and also just to see the magnificence of the Spirit and how wonderful the Spirit is, and, and it's really neat. So the first thing I want to show you is here in uh, Acts 5 and verse 1. It says, But a, serp serpent, <laughs> a certain man named Ananias and... Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And then it goes on, and Ananias and Sapphira, of course, get zapped. We looked at that Sunday. But in verse 3, who did Ananias lie to? In verse 4, who did he lie to? God. 
Holy Spirit is God. Now, again, in this group here, I hope that's not news to anybody, but, but th there's a scriptural evidence there that the Holy Spirit is God. Okay? Look over with me, if you would, at 1 John 5, 7. If you've ever heard of a thing called the Johnine comma, this is it. 1 John 5 and verse um, 7. It says, um, what does it say? It says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, if you have a, a study Bible, there's probably a note somewhere that says that verse probably shouldn't be in your Bible. Um, but it should, and there's, there's good scriptural evidence for it. But there is another verse, and these three are one. The Father, the Word, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is God. Now, the, the way the Spirit has dwelt with or related to man has changed, but it's always been one Spirit. Um, so like I said, look, uh, come with me and look at John 14. John 14. Were you reading your note in your Bible? Does it say it shouldn't be there? The best, the best manuscripts don't have... Yeah. First John 14. Or, no, no, John. John. Yeah. Well, if you can find First John 14. <laughs> John 14, verse 16. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So a couple things here. You see, he's, he's identified as, as a distinct member there. Right? The Holy Spirit is the Comforter. Jesus is speaking. He talks about the Father and another Comforter. He calls that Comforter the Holy Spirit. So Jesus thinks the Holy Spirit is a third person of the Godhead, if you will. But he also gives him, calls him him. See in verse 17, several times, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you. Again, giving an attribute of, of personhood to the Spirit, if you will. And you know, a lot of people get upset when you call God a person, but that's the only way uh, the human mind's going to get. Now, we're not talking about three gods, but the Spirit is, has a personality, if, if I can put it that way. Um, he, and we'll go, um, look over at 1613. The follow-up on that issue of the, the personality, if you will, or the, the personage of the Holy Spirit. How be it when he the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now just as an aside here, you see at the end of verse 13 it says, and he will show you things to come. We're in the book of the Gospel of John right now. Okay. What did the Holy Spirit show the writer of the Gospel of John? The book of Revelation. Yeah. Isn't that kind of an interesting concept there? That I mean, if, you, if you go over to Revelation and you look at it, he says, I was in the, in, the Lord, in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And so you can see how this, this book is put together and it makes some sense. So there's a good, you know, people want to say, well, because another attack on the book of Revelation and... Uh, we, you know, you like to watch these, Helen. We watch them in the, the, the Bible programs on, the, on TV. Of course, they always get the, the liberals, but they say... I like to watch them and yell at them. Yes, exactly. You, you, like, yes, ex yell at them. But they would like to say that Revelation was written in code to the Christians. And uh, the Christians of their, of their time could figure out John's code, but the Romans couldn't, because, you know, the Romans were barbarians, apparently. <laughs> but, yeah, most, most of your liberal scholars, biblical scholars 
will tell you, will say that Revelation is really everything in about Revelation is about Rome, and it was just written in code. Well, this is where the Holy Spirit says, "No, I'm going to show you some things that are to come." So, okay, so we've seen that he is definitely a, a person. He's a, a, the third person of the Godhead. He's identified as a male. Um, get Acts seven. Acts 7, and we're going to go to Ephesians 4 as well. So, Acts 7, verse 51, says, Ye stiff-necked and sun-circumcised in hearts and ears, ye, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So the Holy Ghost does not overcome you and make you do something. You can see there, the nation of Israel, they resisted the Holy Spirit. Look over to Ephesians 4.30. And Paul tells us to, or not to, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we can grieve that Holy Spirit. That issue where people say, well... I was just overcome by the Holy Spirit, and I, 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 he, just, he was controlling me. No. You make a decision to follow the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be resisted. And it's not that the Holy Spirit's uh, impotent. It's that God has given us free will. It goes all the way back to the garden. God loves free will. The Holy Spirit is a comforter if we avail ourselves of that comfort. He will edify us if we avail ourselves of that edification. Just like Jesus Christ will save us if we believe, if we walk after the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will do His work in our, in our life, if you will. Um, he can be resisted. He can be grieved. Um, oh boy, should have had you stay there. Uh, look back at John 16 again. Uh, right now, really, what I want—I just want to look at some of the, some of the personality, if you will, of of the Spirit. Uh, John sixteen, verse eight, and when he, um, pick it up in verse seven, it says, "Nevertheless, I tell you the truth: it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you." And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit, he is going to be reproving. He's going to be convicting the world of their fault. Of their, uh, he's going to make manifest the sin in the world. And how does he do that? He does that through the Word of God. Um, but, but when Jesus left the earth, judgment didn't leave the earth. The Holy Spirit is here through, the, through his Word, reproving the world. And it shows you in three ways. And if you go through, you can see why. Of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So that, that's the three ways the Holy Spirit is going to reprove the world. Look over at Romans 8. You know, I think I told you John spent six or seven weeks going through just the Spirit. And as I got into, I could see why. I could see why. I just, I, as I started looking and in, looking into these things, I just began to have so much fun, and I just wanted to just dawdle over every one. And, and and I just, I go, we'll never get through it. And <laughs> and it's just, it's just, it's just wonderful to to know to see the personality, if you will, of the Holy Spirit that's working in us and 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 is is our help. And we'll we'll see all the things the Holy Spirit is going to do for us. It's just not this, this, this cold being somewhere that's zapping you if you read the Word. If you read the Word of God, He'll come in and He'll say, hey, let's do something. Look, look, look what we can do. Look what I can do. Look what you can do if you rely on me. And, uh, and He can he bring, bring us to great things. And it's, it's really, for me, it was just a fascinating thing. So Romans 8, verse 16. Interrupt myself. The Spirit itself bear witness, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
is it verse 26? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He bears witness with our spirit, not to our spirit, but with our spirit. And he bears witness that you are the children of God. There's comfort there. He's bearing witness with your spirit that you he he's you believe on what the Lord on the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. Boy, there's comfort there, great comfort there, that the Holy Spirit says, "Yeah, you are a child of God." And then He goes on, heir, joint heir, and joint heir, and all of that from there. Um, and then in verse 26. He helps our infirmities. We've looked at that issue of the, the infirmities before. Unsound, unhealthy state of the body. But in the context, I think more that weakness of mind, that weakness of resolution, uh, foibleness, weakness. That's how God's grace is sufficient for us. We rely on the Holy Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit, through God's grace, comes and helps our infirmities, helps us with that, that mental that those those mental issues and that the, the weakness of mind that we all go through every day and you know things things that you, as you go through your not only through as you go through your life but as you go through your day you ebb and flow and and that you know you got you get to the point where you rely on the holy spirit and say okay help and and, and just watch him work just watch him work um the next one we looked at here um he's making intercession for us we don't know how to pray as we are, but he, it's okay. Because he's going to teach us how to pray, but he's going to make intercession for us. He's, he's at that intermediary. Jesus Christ is the mediator, and he's the intercessory, if you will. And again, he's on our side. If God be for you, who can be against you? And they're all for us. And here you see how this Holy Spirit, it's working out. The Holy Spirit is working for us. Um, look over at 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians two verse ten. Verse nine. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. This is one of the you know, you've heard me say it before. First Corinthians two nine is one of the most abused verses in the Bible because nobody wants to keep reading. You know, that's the verse that everybody says, Well, because of that, that's the verse that says you just can't know what God wants. Just can't know God's will. Oh, but keep reading. But God hath revealed them unto us. How? By his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Uh, verse 14 but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned he that is spiritual judges all things and he himself is judged of no man for who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him but we have the mind of Christ you know we can know the deep things of God because the spirit has searched those things out and he's revealed them to us we don't have to go through life wondering what is God's will. What is God, you know, did that traffic light changing mean something to me today? If it's 105 degrees, does that mean something today? The black cat did or did not go in front of me, does that mean something? No. You get saved and the Spirit reveals the things to you. It's, and, you know, it, it goes on to say the natural man he can't know the things of the Spirit of God because he didn't have the Spirit of God. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't get up and teach a uh, comparative religion class. They can read and, and, and understand on an intellectual label, uh, level, but they'll never know it. They'll never, ha under, if you're not saved, the person's not saved, they'll never know that transforming power of the Spirit of God. They'll, they'll never, that's how you go from being the teacher of comparative religion to taking this Bible by faith. That's how you get away from the liberalism, little l, of Bible study 
and saying it's written by 40 men only that Daniel was written 200 years after it was after those events happened that the book of Revelation was written about the time that uh, John actually lived in that the Gospels were written 200 years later and for, their names were forged to them that's how you go from this being a book to this being a, the, the word of truth that it is the word of truth that works effectually in you if you believe it's by the spirit having that spirit in you and that spirit revealing the things of God to you and then you're not grieving the Holy Spirit but following being led by the Holy Spirit look over at Galatians 5 I hope this kind of stuff gets you guys excited about the spirit because it gets me excited. It's just—it's a study I've never done. It, it's, it's been really great. So hope that that's coming through. Um, um, boy, where do I want to start here? Um, Fifteen, if, uh, Galatians five, sixteen. This I say then: Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. You know, think about some of the things we've read just in those few verses. He reproves. He bears witness. He makes intercession. He helps. He leads. If God be for you, who can be against you? He is working for you the whole time. The other thing, you look at this passage here, and my goal tonight is not to expound a lot on these passages, but you see that the spirit and the flesh, they're opposites. And it's interesting, too, you got to go back to the to the, the old-time use of the word, but the, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Well, the spirit what against the flesh? The spirit lusteth, the, lusteth against the flesh. And that's kind of an interesting thing, right? Because lust, that's always bad. I went and looked it up. It's to desire eagerly. What a great term. What a great thing. Boy, that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit desires something for us eagerly that's opposed to the flesh. It has nothing to do with the flesh. He desires that we get edified. And He desires eagerly and earnestly. But if you're walking in the flesh, you can't do it because the flesh and the Spirit, they're as far apart as the east is from the west, as Psalm says about sin. They are, if you are walking in the flesh, you cannot walk in the Spirit. And you can, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to walk in the flesh because they're opposed from each other. That's why we say if you start walking in the flesh, start relying on yourself. I mean, we, we all are going to sin. We're not, I don't even think I'm saying you're going to get to the point where you're never going to sin anymore. Walking in the flesh, from, uh, there are, you know, there's walking in the flesh, doing the things of the flesh. But more than anything, walking in the flesh is relying on the flesh. Because you see, it goes on to say the works of the flesh are. Well, those are all what happens when you come back and you start relying on your own flesh. Those things start happening. Versus if you start walking in the flesh, in the spirit, then you begin to enjoy the fruits of the spirit. And you see in the list there, they're just completely opposites. Relying on the flesh will keep you from the edification that you, that the spirit so eagerly desires for you. And getting edified will keep you help keep you out of that, that uh, fleshly world and those fleshly lusts. So he reproves. He bears witness, makes intercession. He leads. Um, he helps. Look over at um, Matthew 28, verse 28, 19. I want to look at one thing real quick. Second Corinthians, or uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, this is talking to the little flock, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Again, there's all three members of the Godhead are identified. In second, if you turn over to 2 Corinthians 13, you see Paul does the exact same thing in a, in a, in a verse. Second, the last verse of 2 Corinthians, 2 
Corinthians 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Again, there's one spirit and he's always been. There again, though, Paul identifies all three members of the Godhead in one verse. Um, let's go back to Matthew 3. I was talking to a young man one day about uh, the Spirit, and he, he told me, he was repeating a lot of what his father had told him he was a, he was a teenager but he he talked about what i talked about earlier about the the uh, god manifest himself in three different he in three different ways throughout time it was always the same person he just manifested himself differently and i showed this person this verse and he didn't know what to do with this verse um so i i really like this verse <laughs> but look at matthew 3 verse 13 then cometh jesus from galilee to Jor jordan matthew 3 13 then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, there you see all three members of the Godhead being active at the same time. The Father in heaven speaking, the Son being baptized in His incarnation on the planet Earth, and the Spirit coming down and being, that's when Jesus gets that. So it's really a wonderful verse where you can see them all working together. Um, again, there's one Spirit but he has related to man in different ways at different times. The spirit hasn't changed. The way he relates to man has changed. Like I said, we already saw him moving over the face of the deep at creation. So he wasn't really dealing with man at that point. Right? He was just dealing with the creation. He was involved in creation. Um, but I, I want to look at one thing about how significant, there's a couple really significant ways in time past and but now that the spirit operated differently in regards to man. Um, one of them should bring you great comfort to know how he deals with us. And the other one, um, well, should bring you great comfort, but maybe you think some of the things he used to do were kind of cool. <laughs> so uh, come with me, if you would, to 1 Samuel 16. We're going to get 1 Samuel 16, and we're going to get Psalm 51. First Samuel 16, Psalm 51. First Samuel first. First Samuel 16. Um, where do we want to start? Uh, verse thir verse uh, 11. David's about to get, Samuel's going to Jesse, and he finds David, he's going to anoint him. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and withal of a, good, of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So it's very interesting. You see there, and go over to Psalm 51, um, the Spirit left Saul. And you, you can see it's interesting, too, because a little bit later, David becomes the music player, and David plays a soothing music. And that spirit comes back to Saul and he, he gets his mind back. And then the spirit of God leaves Saul and he goes crazy again. David plays the music. There's another interesting thing about music, how music can soothe the soul and an example of that. Um, but you can see the spirit 
he did leave Saul. Okay, look at Psalm 51. Now, this is David's psalm he wrote after his um, dalliance with uh, Bathsheba and the, the murder of um, Uriah. It says uh, in verse 11, uh, look, yeah, just verse 11, Cast me not away, away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, in time past, the Holy Spirit could leave you. And you, you, you do see it in, in a couple. Here's, a, here's some examples where the this, this Holy Spirit would come and then the Holy Spirit would leave. Now, the passage we just looked at with Saul, if you notice the verse before, when the Spirit came to David, it said it was with David from this day forth. So the Spirit never did leave David. But you can see David was a little worried about it after he committed adultery and murder that, um, hey, can you not take your spirit from me is his prayer. And it's a, it's a wonderful prayer. Um, but now, come with me to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 3. First Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 13. Verse 12, that ye should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Look over at Ephesians 4, verse 30 again. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We don't lose the Holy Spirit today. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, the rapture. We are sealed and cannot lose the Holy Spirit all the way to the end of the dispensation of grace. Um, the day of redemption is that moment in the rapture when we get our new bodies. Um, as I was reading that too I noticed in David's prayer we saw in Psalm 51 11, he said cast me not out of your presence God will never cast us out of our presence because we're accepted we are accepted in the beloved um, we'll look at that that's not really an issue of the spirit so much other than the fact that we're sealed King Saul the first king of Israel he was anointed he was God's anointed David many times could have killed him and he was and he said I'm not going to lay a hand to, da to God's anointed he cut a little piece of his garment off and he had tremendous guilt because he had done that to God's anointed and the spirit left Saul. David, great King David, with all his faults, you know, God says, he's a man after my own heart. He made the prayer. Don't take your spirit from me. We never have to make that prayer. Never do we have to make that prayer and that should bring great comfort. We're going to see this when we come to the one hope of the calling, this issue of comfort and being being firm and not blown with every wind of doctrine. This issue of being sealed with the Holy Spirit where we cannot lose the Holy Spirit ever, that brings great comfort. You guys have all heard my story about how I thought I'd blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And I, thought, and the, and I didn't know what to do. I mean, I understood I couldn't work for my salvation, but I'd lost it. Now, how do I get it back? And, you know, trying to run that thing and just the... T Understanding that doctrine... I can tell you what, that, that changed, literally changed my life. You know, there's a lot of people say, well, this happened in Dave's life and that happens in Dave's life. That's what happened in Dave's life. If ever there was a change, that was the issue. Boy, that's great comfort to know you cannot lose the Holy Spirit and you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And if I can dare say it, we make a big deal of it and I don't think we make a big enough deal of that because that's the issue of eternal security, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And you get your head wrapped around that. You will, you will want to perform for God out of gratitude, not for salvation or anything like that. But you'll just look at that and you'll go, okay, I got to quit doing what I'm doing. I mean, this, that's just not fair to God. 
and it's not about sanctifying yourself. About it's just not, not nothing about. Wow, am I grateful for that? And just being gracious in regards to the grace that we have received. Um, but like I said, that there's well, great comfort comes from 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 that. Great comfort. Um, so we've got a couple more things here. Look over at Mark one. Mark, 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 Mark one. Okay. This is going to be another comparison one. So, um, Mark 1, verse 8. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall... Um, let's back up. Verse 6. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, that he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Ghost. Now I'll go through and look at some things here. What I really want you to remember from here is you're going to. Be, Mark tells the the group that's I gets water baptized. They get water baptized. They get identified with the little flock with the believing remnant. He says, "Okay, I've done that, but soon Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit." I just want you to get the issue that they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Look over to Acts one. Acts 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them, boy, this is tough, um, sent, uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So Jesus is with them. He says, okay, you guys got baptized with water, but you were going to get baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Well, at Pentecost, let's turn over to 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, Pentecost means 50, so we're 50 days after the crucifixion. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were baptized with the, with the Holy Ghost and they became filled with the Holy Ghost. And then they were able to speak, speak in tongues. And then look at, uh, and then down at verse 17. Um, this is in fulfillment of prophecy. Peter tells them, uh, verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your among men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And on and on it goes. What I want you to see is they are baptized with the Holy Spirit here, and they are able to do some miraculous things. The prophecy program, Kingdom Saints, were baptized with the Holy Spirit by Jesus Christ, and it resulted them in being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of that was to empower the little flock with supernatural gifts. Okay, let's come over to 1 Corinthians 12 and Galatians 3. First Corinthians 12 first. First Corinthians 12, verse 13. Well, we just read this. For by one spirit we were, for by, not with, for by one spirit we are, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Look at Galatians 3 and verse 27. 
For as many of, of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. In the mystery program, believers are baptized by the Holy Spirit, not with the Holy Spirit. In the Israel's program, Jul Julius Caesar, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus Christ did the baptize. Yeah, I didn't even know where that came from. Um, did the baptizing. In the mystery program, it's the Holy Spirit that does the baptizing. Now, it's a spiritual baptism. And it, that purpose is to identify us with the body of Christ. It's a different operation, and it has a different purpose. Look over at Romans 6. And this is how you know that there's baptism, because there's one baptism. We'll get to that, but there's one baptism. Paul just told us that we are baptized by the Holy Spirit. And this is what we're baptized into. We're into the identification of the body of Christ. Um, Romans 6, verse 2. Uh, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism and into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. But he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He not only identified with the body of Christ, but in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is how you know it's a spiritual baptism, because you, you didn't go into a grave. Okay? This is something that's going on in your inner man, in your spirit. In that, that, that realm where we communicate with God, right? That, that, that spiritual realm. It's not a metaphysical New Age type of thing. It's an identification, and you can see it clearly in verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves, reckon ye also to be dead unto sin. Also because God sees you that way. Because you've been baptized into the death, reckon yourself to be dead and then alive, and then you can live unto God, and you can live that resurrection life. You can, you can live unto God. Look over at Ephesians 5, verse 18. <laughs> Ephesians 5, verse 18. I thought I was going to get through two of these tonight. Mm -hmm. 5, verse 18. Fifteen, fourteen, fourteen. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now he's talking to saved people here. So he's not saying arise from the dead like you're not saved anymore. He's talking about it's a functional death. Arise, get on with the program. Understand who you are in Christ and start living it out in the, you. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Israel was full, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and immediately spoke. Right? We saw that over in Acts. Here, Paul tells us, to be, don't be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing learning process. Now we've seen the Holy Spirit is in us. There's no doubt. There's not a question of that. But to be full of the Spirit is to be not grieving the Spirit. It's to be getting edifying, to be becoming a mature saint, becoming relying more and more on the Spirit or the Spirit living more and more out of us, us living more Christ-like. Now, being filled with the Spirit results in some things too. Look at verse 19. 
for 18, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things in the God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You know, those are some things we've been talking about just generally here, submitting yourselves, you know, uh, having that lowliness and that meekness that we've been talking about. Um, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Boy, maybe I should relook my iPod. Um, you know, there's a tr there's an opportunity you have. Are you going to listen to the wonderful music of the 80s? <laughs> the wonderful oldies goldies of disco? Oh, no. <laughs> or psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? You know, it's, it's real tough to sing the songs of the 80s to the Lord. <laughs> it is very difficult. It's very difficult to do it with anything that's not a spiritual side. It's not possible. But that issue of being filled with the Spirit is an issue of, of um, maturity. It's, it, but it's different. We saw at Pentecost that little flock came down, cloven tongues, <laughs> washing of noise, and they were filled and they were empowered with those supernatural gifts. For us, we get saved, we, we, we get justified by faith, the Holy Spirit indwells us, and then we have an opportunity to walk after the Holy Spirit. And as we do, every day, we get a little more filled and a little more filled and a little more filled and a little more filled. It's just like, you know, may Christ dwell in your hearts by faith. And it's, it's that issue of maturity. It's that issue of doctrine getting in you and working out in you. It's through the Spirit that we are perfected. It's, look over at 1 Corinthians 2. It is through the Holy Spirit strengthening our inner man with might, as we've seen in Ephesians. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Oh, we already looked at this, didn't we? Yeah, we did. This is, this is the issue of the Spirit revealing to us the deep things of God. And we talked about this. Only the saved can understand those deep things of God. See, that's what happens when you get, a, get, a, get ahead of your notes. So, um, is that time right? Are we like at 48 minutes? We're at 52. 52? <laughs> The Spirit works in our inner man through the written Word of God using doctrine to convict, to reprove, to correct, instructing us in righteousness so that we may be perfect, mature, truly furnished unto all good works. Truly furnished unto all good works. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Grow up into Christ. There's an issue of maturity. The Holy Spirit today does not zap us and fill us and give us perfect knowledge. But we can have knowledge. We can have maturity. Through this book and through understanding what doctrine we are to be following and what doctrine we're not. It doesn't mean we don't go into those other places. Of course we do. You know, think about it. A lot of what we learned about the Spirit today, we didn't find in Paul's epistles. It goes all the way back in the Spirit. And, this, and today's the Spirit goes all the way back to Genesis 2. Genesis 1, verse 2. Um, so it's not that we don't study, but to get grounded. And again, we're going to look at this next, next time in that, that hope of our calling. It's through the Holy Spirit edifying us and maturing us and building us up through the study of God's Word rightly divided. And we can uh, grieve His work if we don't grieve Him. That's right, exactly. We can't grieve Him. And you know, we, we talk... For two years, I remember Helen asked that question, and, and we, we had talked about it pretty much quite a bit. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? And it's a great question. It means ignoring a verse. Well, I know the verse says that, but I don't care today. Or I forgot that. Yeah, I, I forgot that verse. <laughs> um, it's, I'm saved, so I'm going to do it anyhow. What difference does it really make? Nobody will ever know. Grieving the Holy Spirit is following the lusts of the flesh. It's not walking in the Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together and study your word. We thank you that you have given us your Spirit, that we are indwelt with your Holy Spirit, and we will never lose your Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit does so many things for us. It, it, 
it comforts us and it leads us and it reproves us and it corrects us. Sometimes we don't like that so much. But it brings us to maturity, to perfection. It edifies us. It is how we get illumination from your word. It is the Holy Spirit that, that completely brings us to maturity through the study of your word, Lord. And we, we know that. And we know it's only possible that the Holy Spirit became and that we can be saved and receive your Holy Spirit because your son came and died on the cross died for our sins, was buried and rose again for our justification, Lord, and we praise you every day for that and for the dispensation of grace, for another day of grace that we live in today, Lord, and that we do live in a time of grace when we are accepted in the beloved and that we can never lose the Holy Spirit and we can never be removed from your presence, Lord. And we praise you and we thank you for that. In your name, amen.